um, what perhaps they may have experienced. Uh, and in particular, I really wanted the Lord to enlighten my spiritual imagination as it pertains to these wise men. And so we're going we're gonna to speak today from the book of St. Matthew chapter 2. Uh, someone read it this morning. I think it was Matthew Elliot, I believe, who talked about the gifts. No? Talked Matthew. about, who was it? Was it Matthew? Yes, it was. Yes. Uh, St. Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to just read three verses. Verse 1, verse 2, and verse 11. Let's read these three verses. Please stand with me as I honor, and together we honor the word of God in your hearing as I read it. Verse 1. Now, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Then Herod, no, verse 2, verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And verse 11 says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say the topic of the message today simply, He is the king. Find another neighbor. Say, he is, he is the king. One more for the Holy Ghost. Look at your neighbor and give them an attitude and say, he is, he is the king. king. I'm so happy to see Taj's two twin sisters. I'm sorry I missed you girls. Nice to see you girls. I'm sure you're happy that Taj is home. Amen. He is the king. You may be seated. He is the king. The gospel of Matthew presents Christ in a very simple way. It presents Christ as king. It was written by a Jew for the Jews. And they had a great hope that the Messiah was coming. In fact, he was often promised that he would come. This Messiah, according to the Jews, would restore the former glories of the kingdom. This Messiah would elevate Israel to the head of the nations. And as the psalmist said in the 72nd Psalm in the 8th verse, and he will reign from the river unto the ends of the earth. This king, they thought, would put an end to Gentile dominion. They hoped that this Messiah would restore its Edenic splendor. My God. And bring blessing to all mankind. They believed that Jerusalem would be the capital if his global of his global empire. And that Jerusalem would be the center of universal worship of Jehovah our God. Now the Jews ignored the spiritual aspects of those Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. And they became so fascinated and so enamored uh, by the promises of a Messiah who was coming to reign that they forgot the promises of the Messiah who would come to redeem. Mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. They wanted a militant they wanted a commander, a general, who would break the power of Rome and usher in a new world order based on Judaism. Judaism is an interesting ism. <laughs> and they wanted this new world order to have its center in Jerusalem. Now they are partly correct because in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, Jerusalem will be where it's all going to be happening. So that's coming. But God didn't send them a sovereign that they wanted. God sent them a meek king. God sent them a savior whose name 
is Jesus. Emmanuel. God with us. And so since Matthew wrote the book of Matthew for the Jews to convince them that Jesus was their Messiah, it makes sense that the gospel of St. Matthew is saturated with Old Testament references. I found that there are 129 references or citations or allusions made to the Old Testament in the book of Matthew. And that is, in fact, he, he cites 25 of the 39 books of the Old Testament. I'm not sure what that Matthew is. Ask Brother Anthony after service. 89 of those references of the 129, 89 were made by Jesus himself to Old Testament allusions. And in Jesus' allusions, he found the law. In Jesus' allusions, we will hear of the prophets. And in, the, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus also, he will, he will also make, make mention of the writings. Now, although Matthew wrote, oh, glory be to God, I'm getting ahead of myself and I'm getting excited. Although Matthew wrote primarily for the Jews, there is no exclusivism in, amen, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He saw beyond Israel and he saw the church, you and me, which was already a power in the world when he wrote. He saw, he saw Gentiles, you and I, coming into the blessings of God through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. And although the book of Matthew opens with the narrow limits of Jewish thought in chapter 1, chapter 2 introduces us to the, amen, to the wise man from the east. Glory be to God. Who came to worship the Christ the anointed one. It can be exclaimed. It can be proclaimed. It can be pronounced. It can be announced. And it can be heralded from the highest height that he is the king. Yes. Oh, glory be to God. Now, I'm going gonna, gonna to whisk through this. Whisk through this. Whisk. W-I-S-K. Uh, because there are some things I want to say about the fact that he is king. Firstly, firstly, as we look at the text, it is very obvious, well, it may not be. To some, it may be to others. And the question is, what they sought. What the wise men sought. And you can see from verses 1 to 8 just exactly what they sought. But in verse 1, I see their quest. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. They saw a phenomenal sight in the sky. In fact, it was in the distant east. And that phenomenal sight led them to Jerusalem. And the, and, and, and the, and the sight not only startled and stirred Ju Ju the city, but their arrival, glory be to God, stirred and startled King Herod, I want to say this, the great. Mm -hmm. But you see, two years prior to Jesus' birth, a very remarkable thing happened with Jupiter and Saturn. This is factual, my Lord. And one year before Jesus was born, the same thing happened with Mars. What happened was that three celestial bodies, Jupiter, somebody called Jupiter's name this morning, somebody, I think it was Alandra, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars went through what is called a conjunction, which is when three celestial bodies meet or pass, oh God, in the same degree of the zodiac where they are. Lord have mercy. And this resulted in a new, extraordinary, and brilliant star that became very, very visible. And the renowned astronomer Kepler said, he believes, oh Lord, he believes 
that such a star appeared just before Jesus' birth and that that was the star that the wise man saw. Kepler, Kepler, Kepler. Somebody say Kepler. Kepler. Kepler made an astonishing discovery of this conjunction in the 1500s. So he didn't just come yesterday. And I find it ironic that astronomy and those who study the celestial ball, those who study the heavens, those who study the stars, and would remember Kepler who was born in the 1500s. He said it is his belief that what they saw was the conjunction of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. And because God knows every name of every star, because God knows the name of every celestial body and bowl. Glory be to God. God, I believe, calls those three. Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. Conjunct together. Lord have mercy. Get together. I want to send some three boys to Jerusalem. I got something to show them. Oh, I'm getting excited. So that was their quest. They, their quest was to find this Jesus who was born in Jerusalem. What was their question? Their question was, number in verse 2, where is he that is born king, capital K, of the Jews? Is there in your Bible? Number 2, verse 2. Not a prince. Usually, babies born in royalty are called princes or princesses. And also, they have to wait their turn. Lord have mercy. Huh. Lord have mercy. Huh. And, so, and so, when they asked that question, great King Herod got stirred. And the reason why he got stirred was because his name on earth had become displaced in heaven. Can I tell you, church, glory be to God, it doesn't matter what Satan tries to do to you. His name has been displaced from heaven. And because of that, what is for you is for you. What God has promised you is for you. And it doesn't matter what Satan says. It doesn't matter what Satan tries. It doesn't matter what even lies he tells on you. He might even try and tell God the truth. He has been displaced from heaven. He has been displaced from heaven. And anything he tries to sell upon us is very much temporary and limited to the mighty power of Jehovah God. So that the storm sprang up. Yes. They don't worry me. I'm sheltered in the arms of God. And greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. He said, I create the waster. I create the destroyer. And he said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And so, because Satan has been displaced from heaven, it doesn't matter what he tries. He can get trouble all he likes. Herod would have his day. So, the fact that the wise man acknowledged him as born king had to have sent chills up and down Herod's evil spine. Had to. And so, when we consider as a backdrop to their question, where is he born king of the Jews? Never had the royal house of David fallen to such a low estate than when the, when the, when the wise man appeared in Jerusalem. Because you see, an Edomite, a descendant of Esau, was now on the throne. My God. And so a long struggle between Esau and Jacob was about to come to a head as the serpent's brood of Edomite Herods set themselves against the Lord's anointed one. But go to the end of the book. We know who wins. Listen to Herod's credentials. His reign was one of carnage, bitter hatred, suspicion, and terrible atrocities. 
This great King Herod filled Jerusalem with, my God, foreign mercenaries who ripped off the people. And he filled Palestine with spies. I want to pause here and talk about Palestine. Because in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, Palestine will be restored to the home of Israel. And the people of God, Israel, will dwell in Palestine. And David will be co-regent unto Jesus Christ the King during the millennium. So whatever the Syrians try, whatever the Iraqis try, whatever, my God, the Muslims try, they will not get it. Israel because God has promised that Palestine will be a place where the glory of God will reign and try all you want devil you will not win what God has for you belongs to you King Herod the great they call him he murdered anyone who claimed the throne. He stamped out and wiped out anyone who was popular with the Jews. He even killed his wife's brother who had developed influence among the Jews. He murdered his wife, Mary Amni. Because he was suspicious of her. And he murdered both of her sons. Which means they may not have been his sons. And five days before he died. He murdered his son. Who was heir to his throne. In fact Caesar Augustus of the day. Said this of Herod the Great. I'd rather be a pig. Than be Herod's son. End quote. Herod's, King Herod the Great, his crimes affected his brain. Because after he murdered his wife, he became mental. This is factual. This is King Herod the Great, oh God, who was on the throne when Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. The story of Herod says that he, after Miriam died, or oh, he killed her, he murdered her. He married <laughs> numerous other women. He had numerous concubines. He had numerous female slaves. And all of them got the same treatment as his first wife. My Lord. This is Herod the Great <laughs> who was on the throne when Jesus was born. I said he is king. Lord have mercy. And one day, Herod's history says that he was walking along one of the royal courts and he saw a fine looking woman. And of course, he had an insatiable lust for her. What did he do? He was the king, the great. He seized her. He married her. He had her, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And he ignored the fact that she was a common prostitute. And that she was a common prostitute. And as a result, he contracted a horrible STD. What was his reply? This is the king who was on the throne. What was his reply? He said, Miriam has come back to curse me. Lord have mercy. And so when he contracted this venereal disease from the common prostitute, Lord have mercy. And he became mantle. A new fire of, man, of madness coursed through his veins. And this church of God, Miracle Temple, was the man who sat on the throne when Jesus was born. A dangerous despot, if you please. A suspicious scallywag, if you please. A crafty, cold-blooded killer. An unscrupulous tyrant. And history has the nerve to call him Herod the Great. My Lord. But you see, not only did the wise men have a quandary after they, uh, they, they were uh, what they sought, they... They, not only did they have a question, but they had a quandary. And the quandary is found in verses 3 to 8. The quandary was that Herod became troubled. 
And of course, I just gave you the litany of his, his job description or his resume or his resume. And, 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 and of course, when Herod couldn't get his way, there was always what? Bloodshed. Yeah. And so when the Bible says Herod got troubled, my God, the wise man knew how Herod would carry on. And so in his troubled state, he finds his counselors, verses 4 to 6. And he tells them, I want you to find out where he is born. And guess what they told him? What Micah said, that he would be born in Jerusalem. In, I'm sorry, in Bethlehem. Not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem. And so the Bible says that after he had inquired of, of this, my God, he then resorted to cunning means, verses 7 and 8. And, and that word, that word, in, uh, there's a word there it, which, which is, he inquired of them diligently. Yes, <laughs> yes that's what it says? Yes. Mm -hmm. In verse 7, the word diligently means he went to every means possible to ensure that what that he had inquired of, he received. And so, being cunning and unscrupulous as he is, I said, he is the king. Being cunning and unscrupulous as Herod was, in verse 8, that word diligently appears again. Am I right? The word diligently in 7 means a little different from diligently in 8. Lord have mercy. Because you see, in verse 7, he was, was appearing to be very much concerned because he wanted to what? Worship the baby. But in verse 8, the Bible says that he spoke to the, the wise man and said, listen, go diligently. That's what he said. Go and search diligently. In verse 8, he was being crafty. Because he knew he really didn't want to worship the king. He wanted to murder the king. Lord have mercy. Ah, but you can't murder the king of kings. And so, and so, after their discourse with Herod the Great, so they say, the Bible says in verses 9 to 11 that they sought something. No. Verses 1 to 8, they sought something. But in verses 9 to 11, they brought something. Isn't it interesting that during their journey of seeking, they run into a despot who claimed to be king. But every time somebody tried to say he wasn't the king, he murdered them. And then the Bible says, after his discourse with the three wise men, the Bible says in verse 9, the star suddenly appeared again. Right? Doesn't it say that? Well, glory to God. What happened was that to the star had never left. But to Herod, he saw blood. He couldn't see the star. And I want to tell you, church, the devil might pose as nice as he looked. He might pose, smelling nice, looking nice, speaking nice, saying the right thing, knowing all the right thing, knowing that he might know it, but he will not see the star. And so if you want to be able to be him, you have to make sure that you can not only see the star, but discern the star. That's why discernment is necessary in the church. I'm going to back off. That's why discernment is necessary in the church. Uh, because we're dealing with a devil who understands that he hath but a short time. And because of that, he's going to try all he can and do all he can to upset, to divert, and to pull people away from the purpose. But the devil is a liar. Amen. John 8, 44. He's a liar and he is the father of lies. And he abode not in the truth. Oh, glory be to God. And I want to tell you, church, my God, God let those wise men see the star. He didn't let 
them get distracted uh, from what Herod had tried uh, because they knew uh, that Herod was a despot. Uh, they knew uh, that he was a tyrant. Uh, they knew, my God, uh, that he had no good for Jesus. Uh, they knew, uh, just like the Egyptian pharaohs, uh, if it's a man child, uh, kill him. Uh, and he wanted to kill uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, but the song lets us know uh, that they could not destroy. Oh God could not keep his body down. Amen. But when they thought they had him, he said I'll rise again. Ain't no power on earth gonna hold me down. And I am convinced as sure as my name is what it is, that nothing will hold us down. If the king is in our hearts, nothing and no one can stop us. If the king is in our hearts, nothing no circumstance, no difficulty, no my God trial, no tribulation, no test will be able to get the better of us because the king is on the inside and greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Give God praise in the house. Hallelujah. And so Satan, Satan in verse 8. He thought that he would use Monster Herod, not, great, not King Herod, Monster Herod, to try one more time to get rid of the seed of the woman. Maybe he knew Genesis 3.15. Maybe Herod knew his Bible. Well, no, not his Bible. Maybe he knew what Genesis 3.15. He didn't have a Bible. So maybe Satan told him, look, there's a book in the world called the Bible. And there's a verse and chapter in there. You have to make sure that Genesis 3 is called Genesis. And can you hear, can you hear Herod trying to pronounce Genesis? Genesis. 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 No! Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 15. You can imagine the time that devil had, that monster. You see, because the reason, with, with what they bought, with what they brought, sorry, the wise men, they had a goal. And I'm nearly done. Their goal, their goal, their goal was to worship him. Listen, if you and I want to experience the power and the glory of God in our lives, if you and I want to experience, amen, another level, you have to have one goal, that is to worship God. Listen, you're not made to make a lot of money. You're not made to make a lot of money. <laughs> we were, I got about 1,500 ties home. I wasn't made to have a whole lot of ties. And guess what? Most of the time, I wear the same group. Yeah. Maybe about 12 of them. <laughs> yes. huh. We're not made for this world. No. We're made for the glory of God. And therefore, we must live that a life that live gave bread that brings glory and honor to God. And our chief aim is to worship Him. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. <laughs> this is my daily bread to worship and give God. Tell your neighbor, you are created by God to give Him glory. God just has decided to bless us the way he has. But he's not blessing anybody who doesn't have a goal to worship him. Hallelujah. Check this out. The, the Bible says, pardon me, I don't have my contact lenses in, nor my glasses. I only really see man as trees right now. So, the Bible says in verse 11, when they got to the house, and saw the baby in Mary's arms. What does it say? They what? And what? Worship. Worship too. Yeah. Not her. 
they worshipped him. So then, where do some jokers in the world get the idea? Oh, hail Mother Mary. Huh? Come on, man. That's not Bible. They worshipped him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you worship your money, if you worship your mama, if you worship your car, if you worship your daddy, if you worship your degrees, if you worship what you have, it's idolatry. They worshiped him. And I stand and declare today as the shepherd of this house that there will be no worship of people. There will be no worship and high regard of people and things. But we will worship God for the other circumcision who worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. I think glory to God that God gets sick and tired when people take time to worship other people and to highlight who they are rather than give God glory than give Give God honor and give God praise because he alone is worthy. Once have I heard, twice have I spoken that power belongs to God. And you were sick when you were sick. Who you worship and what you worship could not heal you. Only God heals. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, we respect Mary. Yes. Oh yeah, we respect her. Yes. Her name is spelled with a capital M. Yes. She says a pronoun. That's right, pronoun. Noun. See, I go and go to school again. <laughs> Proper noun. Thank you, school teachers. So we respect her. But listen, they worship him. The, and that was their goal. And Mary does not deserve the place. That is reserved for the king. Not our king. The king. She didn't deserve it. And she doesn't deserve it. And so anybody who worships her is an idolatry. I didn't say that. The Bible did. I spoke on behalf of the Bible. Listen. Listen. If you go to any church and people worship people. I went to... I went to New York. Um, who's that? I went to New York. Um, Bishop Thomas, sister, when I preached to, to Pastor Abraham. Uh, what's, her, what's her name before she got married? Pastor Finn. Everybody know Pastor Finn? Mm -hmm. I went to preach in her church. And, and so, yeah, Pastor Elsie Finn. And that's a dangerous woman, but she's not afraid of the devil. She's not. Anyway, went to her church, and, and the bishop, Bishop Thomas, uh, decided to invite me uh, to preach at his church on the Sunday morning because I wasn't preaching at the convention. Uh, they had another preacher. And so when I got to the church, they were titling me as His Grace. I thought, what church am I in? <laughs> Called me His Grace. I never, I never had a title like that. I felt weird even being called His Grace. <laughs> and I think, I think the the His Grace, the most something Bishop Clark Myers. I'm like, whoa. Who told them all those titles? I don't have this. <laughs> his Grace. I need more grace. I certainly can be His Grace. <laughs> And so listen, when you, go, when you go to a church and you hear his grace and his dominant potentate and all that stuff, when you hear that, think of Matthew 2 and verse 11. Fell down and worshipped him. <laughs> they worshipped him. And I'm going to close. Who they sought, they eventually found. And what they bought or what they brought, they eventually gave. This is what intrigues me about these wise men. There are many traditions that abound concerning 
the Magi. Yes? Although the Bible doesn't say it, it is said that there were three of them. We, yeah? <laughs> and the Bible, and, and so the idea was developed around the fact that three gifts are mentioned. Okay? Now, some say that they were three kings. We three kings of Orientar. Yeah? They were three kings. Some say that the wise man represented the three races of the earth. The Japhetic race, the Hamitic race, and the Semitic race. Who are those guys? Japheth, Ham, and Sham, the sons of Moses. Noah, sorry, Noah, thank you, thank you. A lot of people so big today. Wonderful. The sons of Noah. Some say that the Magi were named Casper. Yeah, Casper. Like Casper. Who? How do you know about that? Some say they were named Casper. Some say they were named, one was named Melchior. And one was named Balthasar. Some say that. Another tradition says of the Magi that one was young, one was middle-aged, and one was very old. Sounds plausible. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible just says that they brought, they brought gifts. They brought gifts. But I like, amen, this thought. I like this idea concerning the three. <laughs> oh, glory be to God. One wise man felt sure that what the world needed was a king. One who could rule the nations with authority and power. They, one wise man thought, uh, one they needed, the world needed one who would put down unrighteousness. The world, and he would bring in prosperity and peace to mankind. Glory to God. And so this one wise man, as he was so sure that the star, the conjunction, would lead him to the king, he brought a gift that was relevant for a king. He bought the gift of gold, which is the treasure of kings. Uh, the second thought uh, is that one, the second wise man, my God, knowing that the world's ideas of God were warped, uh, he thought uh, that God needed to come down to earth uh, in human form and to show the world uh, what he was really like. And so, wanting God to be manifest in the flesh, uh, this one wise man brought frankincense. Uh, which is a gift for deity. Amen. Because you see, with deity, incense or the frankincense was used for worship. Oh, glory be to God. And then the third idea, amen, of the third gift was that one, one wise man knew that the world was a sinful place. That badly, that madly, and sadly, the world was in need of one capital O who would take on himself uh, the weight uh, and guilt of the sins uh, of mankind uh, and atone for every one of us. Uh, and so this wise man knew uh, that the star that he, he was going to see uh, would lead him uh, to the Savior. Hallelujah. And so uh, convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that such a Savior must also be a great sufferer, he brought myrrh. Hallelujah a gift to one who is destined to die since myrrh was used to embalm the bodies of the dead 
Lord have mercy. And as I thought about these three men, uh, amen, I'm saying three. It may have been 12. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But one thing the Bible does say is that they brought gold, uh, they brought frankincense, uh, and they brought myrrh. Can I tell you, uh, this was about 33 years uh, prior to the death uh, of the very one whom they were seeking. Come on now. And so their gifts, in my estimation, were prophetic to say the least. Not pathetic, prophetic, prophetic. And when they saw, my God, when those three men bearing gold, when those men bearing gold, frankincense and myrrh, when they saw that the star, the conjunction of Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter led them to an animal stall. Amen. Which smelled of animal waste. They obviously were overwhelmed. They were obviously dismayed at the same time. And I believe in my spiritual imagination that they heard Mary singing uh, what is contained in Luke. Uh, it says, my soul, uh, I, my soul uh, doth magnify the Lord uh, and my spirit uh, hath rejoiced uh, in God my Savior. And so when they heard Mary singing, Lord have mercy, the Lord cried the first wise man, I have found the king. King, and he gave his gift of gold in God cried the second wise man I have found my God and he gave him the gift of frankincense and the third wise man cried my savior chorus him he said I have found my savior and he gave him the gift of myrrh knowing that the savior would have to suffer and die one day for the sin of the world. I said he is the king and church miracle temple in rapturous harmony. I believe these wise men who had met the sinister king Herod and had having an out and having had a clear and unforgettable image in their minds of this demonic despot in all likelihood they may have some take me to the king. I I don't have much to bring. What? My heart is torn in pieces. So take me to the king. They may have sung, we shall see the king. We shall see the king. We shall see the king when he comes. He's coming with power. We will hail the blessed hour. And we shall see the king. When they were prophetic after all. But I believe they sung in rapture with harmony. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. Jesus, 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 oh, he is the king of kings, he is the Lord of lords, his name is Jesus, Jesus. I know that at that time the Holy Ghost had not come where they could have been filled with the Holy Ghost but I believe glory to God that when they recognized the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords they forgot about Herod the monster they forgot about Herod the tyrant they forgot about Herod the murderer because they had met their God they had met their Savior they had met their Christ they had met their sufferer they had met their substitute and so when they sang 
together. I believe that the Holy Ghost uh, in a special measure grace down with power to sing together that we have met the king. He is the king and the king that they met is the king who was born. Is the king who was born in a manger filled with hay. But the king, hallelujah, reigns today. And I said it earlier, he will reign in his millennial reign and he will come and renovate this earth and so he will come in power and great glory he the world will know he was more than a priest the world will know he was more than a prophet the world will know he is the king of kings the world will know he is the Lord of Lords. What's your responsibility? Your responsibility today is to bring him the best gift you can. And the best gift is you, yourself, and your praise. The best gift you can give God is to give him your worship. Oh, come, let us adore him for him. He alone is worthy. We'll give him all the glory. We'll cast our crowns at his feet because he is the king and the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords and we praise him and we worship him and he alone deserves our praise. Stand to your feet. Let's give the king of kings and the Lord of lords a rousing high praise in the house on this Sunday before Christmas. Hey, he is the king. Like people wonder and ponder during the Christmas season what gift they'll get for this person and what gift they'll get for that person. What will I give him or her that is relevant? What gift will I give him or her that is best fitting for them whom I love? But my question is, what gift do you have for the Savior? What gift do you have for the Savior? Are you caught up in the monetary and the commercialism of Christmas so that you're concerned about making sure everybody gets a gift and Jesus is left out? You give him Jesus a little tip or give him, my God, the, the, the rest of what's good the, 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 or give him, my God, the leftovers. But my question is, what do you have for the king today? Hallelujah. You may not have gold, you may not have frankincense or myrrh, but you can give the king your life. You can give the king your worship, hallelujah. And to consider someone worship means that you think they're worthy of your admiration. Oh, glory to God. And so today, I want to ask you a personal question. What gift do you have for the king? I think it's ludicrous anyway to get caught up in the commercialization of Christmas because the field isn't even. Some have and some don't have. I know when I was a little boy coming up, my, my birthday is the week before Christmas and I got nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. Why? Birthday is too close to Christmas. And when Christmas came, 
All of us got the same thing. Pajamas. A book. Some underpants. Foot of the loom. White ones. That's all they had there were white. Now they got red, green, black, purple, orange, indigo, blue. Underpants. Undershirt. You know I got a blue pair of socks. I can't even find blue socks now. I only have black socks. Mama couldn't afford to buy me a birthday gift. No. Birthday is too close to Christmas. I'm using my money for Christmas. So the people that don't have are at a, at, at a disadvantage. If you commercialize Christmas... But I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I don't care. You may not have a turkey. You may not have a ham. Those of you who eat pork. You may not have the privilege of having a cassava or farine pie or, or stuffing. Um, cranberry sauce, rolls, mineral, mineral. You may not have the privilege of sitting at a table with family and enjoying Christmas. But oh, my friend. Christmases will come and Christmases that are commercialized will go but Jesus is still the king of kings so while you enjoy your family enjoy your gifts enjoy your power whatever enjoy it but don't leave the savior out I call on fathers to call the family around the tree and have morning have devotions before you open up gifts I call on every father come on now I couldn't and there's no no daddy mama get your children get up come on devotions he is the king not what's around that piece of tree that can go brown if it hasn't gone brown yet I no, no, I know, I know I'm not popular. I know that. I'm not the most popular 50-something-year-old young preacher. But I'm sticking to the book, baby. This book will not lead me astray. And one of the problems we have in the body of Christ is that we have become so, so hoodwinked and we become so, 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 uh, so immersed in commercialism and the party spirit that God is, has a stomachache. Right. How some of us treat him. I know I'm not popular. But it's the truth. You've got to give Jesus what belongs to him. What if Jesus said to you or to those of us who just engage in friv frivolity and, and party spirit and, and reveling and drunkenness. What if Jesus said, I don't want to give you breath today. And right after he says it, you open your eyes. Just before he says it, you open your eyes. He says it and you close them for good. Never. Let's, come on now. Come on. Let's be real. This is how serious this thing is. This is not a joke. Oh, we can have fun, laugh, and have a great time in church. But at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge the king. Hallelujah. And I call on Bermuda to acknowledge the king. Hallelujah. I'm a part of a prayer force. A prayer force of Holy Ghost-filled believers. I want to encourage anybody who can, anybody who can, join ministers. And pastors at Cedar Bridge Academy tomorrow evening at 7.
because we want to we want to bombard Bermuda with the God. Listen, the, the Bermuda is in a right position for God. I'm not seeing the bad note. No, I'm not. I see the good in this. I see God, I see God galvanizing his people. So if you can go to Cedar Bridge tomorrow, come and join us. Come and join us. And let Bermuda know that Jesus is the king. It's, listen, the church has a wonderful opportunity right now to be who she really is. Hallelujah. This is not the time for hate. This is not the time, my God, for homophobia. This is not the time, my God, for judgment. This is the time to share the love of the king because it works. Hallelujah. So, I, we call on Bermuda to acknowledge the king. I told the premier and the governor in our yard in September, we must serve God and not walk from out of his presence as a nation. Because if we do, we open ourselves to every form of diabolical and demonic demise. And so we acknowledge the king. So my question to you today is, in brief, no preaching tonight, candlelight service, can be real nice in brief. What do you have for the king? What gift do you have? Hallelujah. Ask your neighbor. Say, neighbor. What gift do you have for the king? Can I suggest to all of us here today, if you find yourself on the struggle end of Christmas from a commercial perspective, if you find yourself there and you have Jesus, this could be the best Christmas that you could ever have. Because usually folk that have a lot, they eat a lot, they drink a lot, they party a lot, they get drunk a lot, and they forget Christmas came and Christmas meant. I've seen people get so drunk during Christmas. Not, not only with alcohol, you know. Drunk from food. La, 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 la. Uh, got that ethnic disease. <laughs> ethnic fatigue? Listen, listen. This Christmas time, don't be giving too much appetite. Eat to live. And don't live to eat. I was like that, you know. I live to eat. What? Love my boy, still do. But I got a wife. She watches the size of my plate. And now my daughter's her. Oh, Lord. Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> Daddy, not too much of that. Don't be giving too much appetite during this Christmas period. Eat that which, which satisfies your sophisticity. Your great grandpa satisfies your sophisticity. Bishop Fab, yeah. Just eat what you need. In fact, can I ask you to do this? Eat less and praise God more. <laughs> so listen, because if you're full from too much eating, you don't even want to talk. And you go, you, you go, listen, this is true. You go to sleep and you got to sit up because you can't lay down. <laughs> so don't overeat. Seriously. Rather than have Rather than have four meals, <laughs> rather than have four meals a day, have two. One in the morning and one about four o'clock. So that by seven or eight o'clock you can lay down properly. I'm saying, listen, this, listen, this thing called life is practical. And and I have had some horrible I've, I've had some horrible experiences 
with food. I don't know why I'm over here, but listen, don't overeat. Give God more praise than what you eat during this Christmas period, man. I'm serious. But listen, we're not going to need this body when we go up there. That's why we're going to drop it in rice. This is a temple right now. And so we cannot destroy the temple. So don't let, don't let commercialization, don't let food just cause you to, 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 to poison and contaminate your temple. Your temple is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So give God more praise this Christmas than you eat pie. Sounds funny. Well, it makes sense to me. Now we've laughed. And I, you know, I, I don't necessarily say things to make you laugh, but it sounds funny. But the seriousness of this thing is this. Make sure that you give Jesus a gift this Christmas. If you're saved, then give your life back to him. Rededicate your life to him. If you're not saved, this will be a good time to enter into the Christmas season. Giving your life to Christ. If you're not saved. Hallelujah. So if you're not saved, start walking. Meet me. If you're not saved, I make no apologies for, for embracing the gospel message of salvation in any experience, in any sermonic experience. The, because the, 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 the invitation to salvation is always relevant. Hallelujah. Christmas including. And so the wise men searched. They got a bit complicated by Herod the monster. But the star appeared. Showed them where they had to go. And when they got where they were, they gave what they had. Give the, give the Lord what you have this day. Give him what you have. And can we for a moment pause to just give God a high note of praise in memory and in consideration of what he's done for us? Can we raise our hands and just give God the praise and the glory? For being so good to us, for remembering us in our lowest state, <laughs> and for his mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Can we just give God praise? Hallelujah! On this day, because he is worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy of praise. Snatched, up, snatched us out of the pit, redeemed us from our destruction, pulled us out of the muck and the mire changed our thought processes changed our behavior changed our what we say changed what we do can we give god praise for being so good to us and not holding our sins against us can we give god praise hallelujah hallelujah thank you jesus and so our savior our king We humble our hearts before you today, acknowledging that you are God and you are Lord of all. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the emphasis of worship, which is upon him and not upon his mother. Upon him and not upon the gifts. In fact, your word says it's more blessed to give that it is to receive. And these men gave. They gave in consideration of what the Savior would one day give. And so, Father, help us this Christmas season to be careful what we do, to be careful of what we say, <laughs> to be careful of the company we keep. Give us a discerning spirit this Christmas. Oh, God, to remember you and to give you more praise and eat less pie. Father, help us. Some of us, Lord, we struggle with, with, with appetite, desire. We, we love to eat. Some of us love to eat, Father. And then when we eat all that food, God, we go through things physically. And so, God, help us this Christmas to use discretion. Help us to eat in moderation. 
Help us not to, my God, get so, so caught up in all the stuff of Christmas. And help us, Father, this Christmas to acknowledge Jesus, who is the King. Because all the truth is the day will come when everybody will bow. And everybody will confess. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. And so now God help us, oh God, to be in preparation for that day when we will bow. Amen. And acknowledge you as sovereign and as king. Bless everyone in this house today. Bless every family let this be the best Christmas that all of us have had. As we enjoy your presence, as we enjoy fellowship with family, as we enjoy fun, and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Thank you for Miracle Temple. Thank you for the work that you're doing amongst us. Thank you, O oh God, for your power and the glory of the... Thank you, amen, for, for manifesting yourself in the lives of your people. Thank you, O oh God, for remembering us. Thank you, O oh glory be to God, for loving us the way you do. Father, we return our love to you and say thank you for all that you have done. Bless us, Father, and make us a blessing. Keep our children covered while they're during their Christmas break. Keep them safe from harm and danger. Let no evil or harm befall us. Amen. Let no evil or harm befall this land. In the name of Jesus, keep us in your care. Protect us from harm and danger. We will be careful to give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.